Hi, in this video I'm going to tell you about the sword and shield in the Han Dynasty. Yes, I know some people already made a video about this. But unfortunately, there are just too many misconceptions and mistakes in that video. But I'm not going to tell which video it is, because right now, I'm not sure those misconceptions were in the video simply because the fault of the maker of the video, or because these misconceptions are widespread on the internet right now. But I found it quite unbelievable to see so many mistakes and misconceptions in a single video made by one man, and at the same time so many necessary historical details was not included. There's gotta be a bigger problem behind it. So in this video I'm not going to offend any YouTubers. Most of the major misconceptions are about how the sword was used in Han Dynasty. For example, one misconception I see recently claims the Jian, the double-edged Chinese sword, was not a slashing weapon and almost only used for thrusting. So only the point and the part near the point of the blade is sharpened. Well, no. First, the Jian, or the Chinese double-edged sword, was not only used for thrusting. Neither did the swordsman in ancient China value thrusting much more than different types of cuts. Let's read something written by ancient Chinese about how the jian was used. Jian are versatile weapons. You can use it to pierce your enemy with a thrust, cut them with a slash. You can also block enemy attack or even hit your enemy with the broadside of the jian. And this versatility is the biggest strength of a jian. Fu qie fu cao li jian. There are some cowardly swordsmen. Even you give them a sharp jian, they still cannot cut through anything, nor pierce anyone with their thrusts. And these are just two of them. There are many more examples. So maybe ancient Chinese swordsmen, using jian of course, use thrusts more when comparing to medieval European swordsmen. But the cut and thrust of jian was both considered very important. It's very inaccurate to say jian is not a slashing weapon or a weapon only used for thrusting. So what about the blade? Is it true only the top third of the blade was sharpened? No. This time I'm using archaeological evidence. Well, of course, most of the steel sword made in Hunters are now heavily rusted. But here is a blade of jian belongs to a private collector, and he removed all the rust on the blade. So first thing you can clearly tell is it looks quite different compared to some weird-looking modern replicas. And according to the collector, the blade was still surprisingly sharp. Only a small part near the bottom of the blade was kind of dull, probably because that part is heavily rusted. And this is him trying to see if the blade is still flexible. And he is even putting the weight of his body on it. Luckily, the blade is still in a very good condition after 2000 years. It didn't break or have any plastic deformation. But in my opinion, such test is too risky. And another misconception I saw recently claims the double-edged Chinese sword, Jian, was a gentleman's weapon only given to the officers, while the single-edged Chinese sword, Dao, was given to the masses of burly foot soldiers. Well, if you read some historical documents that was written in Han Dynasty, you probably won't say that anymore. According to Yong Shi Si Nian Wu Ku Bing Che Ji Bu, which is a very detailed document from a Han Dynasty provincial arsenal, which I used for my last video, and I will probably use it a lot in my future videos. According to the document, the number of jian, double-edged Chinese sword, stored in the arsenal was 99,000, 905, while the number of Dao single-edged sword was 156,135. Well, it's true, the number of Dao was still 50% more than the number of Jian, because it's a much simpler design. But judging from the number of Jian, it's clearly not used as a type of weapon only for the officers. In fact, the number of Jian in the arsenal is even larger than the number of two types of different halberd in the arsenal combined. What is more important is, Dao was also used by officers, nobles, and gentlemen in Han Dynasty. 
Down in ancient China could also be made from very expensive, high-quality steel. Evidence of nobles and officers using dao can not only be found in Han Dynasty documents and murals, but also, according to the archaeological evidence, a lot of nobles choose to put a dao instead of a jian in their tomb to use them in their afterlife. But I don't really want to make a debunk video because, again, there's just too many misconceptions. And I feel a lot of necessary historical detail I have to mention, so the rest of the video will be a normal video about a sword and shield in the Han Dynasty. And if I encounter something related to a misconception that I feel, I cannot really put it in my video naturally. Then I'll tell you what is the misconception and why it is wrong. Let's start from this scene from a cinematic trailer. Of course, the weapon of Lü Bu in this scene is not historically accurate, but today I'm going to talk about the swordsman instead of pole arms. So, what's wrong with these swordsmen? First, if these people are meant to be one-handed swordsmen, then I think they're supposed to have shield because the combination of sword and shield is very common in the ancient Chinese warfare. And if they are meant to be two-handed swordsmen, the sword they are using are not very accurate. Uh, they are too wide, too short, and kind of bulky. In my opinion, it looks like the bronze sword from the Warring State era. The steel two-handed sword in Han Dynasty are much longer, thinner, and in my opinion kind of looks like the medieval European longsword, only the guard is much smaller. Then let's talk about how the sword was made in the Three Kingdoms era and Han Dynasty. The technique of folding blade of the sword when forging is already used by Han Dynasty Chinese and they call this method Bai Lian Gang Fa. It was considered a method of making steel in the time. What they did is they used pig iron, which Chinese already know how to reliably produce them in large quantity at the time, or cheaper in pure steel, which I'll explain how it was made later. After the blade was made from this material, the blacksmith will continuously hidden and folden when forging. In this way, they can slowly reduce the carbon level in the metal and at the same time, homogenize the steel and squeeze out some of the slags in the metal. Chinese like to call how many times a sword was folded when forging, how many times was forged. For example, a Wu Shi Lian Jian. A sword forged 50 times is basically a sword folded 50 times when forging. What I'm showing right now is a sword folded 50 times when forging. It's not really a sword preserved in very good condition, but what makes it precious is the markings on the blade, which says a sword forged 50 times worth 1,500 coins. The method called Bai Lian Gong was the most reliable way of producing steel at the time, but it was very time consuming and it's very expensive. So it was almost used exclusively for sword making. The method of making cheaper steel for all the weapons and tools are made from a method called Chao Gong literally the stir-frying method. The method is to heat small pieces or even powder of pig iron, or as Chinese called them, raw iron, and stir them in the open air until it lost all its extra carbon and became steel. Well, in theory that's what it does. In reality, however, this steel-making method is not very controllable and requires a lot of experience. So sometimes the product of Chao Gang method were in fact wrought iron, or as Chinese called them, cooked iron, instead of steel. But fortunately, people discover a way to make use of these unwanted side product. That is, simply mix the cooked iron with melted raw iron in certain ratio, and then forge them. Historians believe this method was first used in 1st century BC, but it won't be until northern and southern dynasties era when it became a well-tested and most popular method of making steel, known as Guan Gang Fa. Guan Gang Fa was a far more controllable method compared to the stir-frying method. But the quality of the steel made from Guan Gang Fa was still considered much inferior compared to the steel made from Bai Lian Gang Fa, the folding method. So people usually use the steel produced by Guan Gang or Chao Gang method, usually the high carbon steel, as the raw material for the Bai Lian Gang method. The Chinese steel in Han Dynasty was, at this time, one of the best in the world. 
and was sold outside the empire. Even Pliny the Elder, a Roman scholar, mentioned them in his book Natural History, as he writes. But of all different kinds of iron, the pound of excellence is awarded to that which is made by the Saris, the Chinese. Of course, I think there's a very high possibility he is actually talking about the Indian wood steel that was usually advertised as Saric iron in Rome. Though Chinese steel weapons and ingots in hundreds that were sold in Middle Asia at a very high price, I don't think many of them were actually brought to Rome. Because the Silk Road in the Han Dynasty was not as developed as in the later dynasties, traveling between the trading posts and cities can usually take a very long time, and is certainly very tiring and dangerous. Transporting goods like metals is certainly not a very smart choice. Okay, let me go back and talk about the weapons. There are three types of Jian in Han Dynasty in terms of length. The shortest ones are seventy to ninety centimeters. They are one-handed swords and sidearms. The medium-sized one are one hundred to one hundred and ten centimeters. Most of them have a handle no longer than twenty centimeters, but there are exceptions, which have longer handles. Which means the jian in this length could be one-handed sword or two-handed sword. The longest one are more than one hundred and twenty centimeters to up to one hundred and sixty centimeters. The sword in this length are all two-handed swords. But they are not called shuang shou jian because shuang shou jian is a modern term, majorly used for translating English word two-handed sword. And they are also not called zhan ma jian because zhan ma jian in Han Dynasty means the sword used by a royal family or given to high-rank officials as a symbol of power. It's not a combat weapon. Historically, these two-handed swords were given to the heavy infantry, who doesn't need shield to protect them from the arrows. In the Han Dynasty and Three Kingdoms era, there was a type of unit called Xian Zhen. They are the assault infantry who has fine armor but no shield. The most famous one of them was the Xian Zhen Battalion led by Gao Shun, a commander of Lü Bu. The guard and pommel of the Jian could sometimes be replaced by one that's made from jade. Or heavily decorated with jade, this type of decorated jian was called yu ju jian, and they also come with a scabbard that was also decorated with jade. And this is the type of weapon only used by rich officers and other social elites, as a type of sidearm, or simply as a symbol to show off their social status and wealth. Most of the common sword and shieldmen uses huan shou dao. A type of single-edged sword, although the short version of huan shou dao are usually mass-produced weapons, and a lot of them can be seen in the collection of private collectors and antique markets today. But it doesn't mean all of them are cheap weapons. As I mentioned, a good number of huan shou dao are used by nobles and officers, and they are made from very good steel. The shape of the pommel of huan shou dao looks like rings. This design originated from the knives in early Bronze Age. At the time, it was designed so the user can tie them on their belt, or put it on a hook when they are using other tools. Although in later era, scabbard became very common. The pommel was only, almost only used for balancing the weight of the blade. The ring-shaped design was still kept as a type of decoration. The blade of Huan Shou Dao was very narrow, especially when comparing to the Dao in later Chinese dynasties. But the spine of the blade was very thick, which makes the shape of the blade looks almost like a triangle from the front. Oh, and one way people make use of the wrought iron and mild steel is to make the spine of Huan Shou Dao with cheaper mild steel and wrought iron, while the more expensive steel was only used on the edge of the blade. Although most of the Huan Shou Dao are one-handed sword, there were still large number of two-handed Huan Shou Dao in Han Dynasty and Three Kingdoms era. They are at least a hundred and twenty centimeters long. Though still somewhat cheaper than the double-edged sword or jian, this single-edged long sword was still given to the officers and well-armored heavy infantry. The most common type of shield was seen on Han Dynasty terracotta soldiers, and in the tomb was a type of middle-sized shield called Shuang Hu Dun. Based on archaeological evidence, this type of shield was sixty to ninety-five centimeters long, 
45 to 55 centimeters wide. The strange dual curve shape was believed to be designed for the spearsmen and pikemen, so they can make their weapon more stable by putting them on the side of the shield, especially when forming a shield wall. But this type of shield was also used by the swordsmen in this era. Almost all of the shield made in Han Dynasty found by archaeologists today are lacquered, sometimes also covered with leather. Of course, plain wooden shield was also used by the soldiers at the time, but since those shields were not lacquered, the wood could not last very long, and they certainly would not be put into the place with somewhat better condition for protecting relics, for example the tombs of the nobles. Therefore, none of them can be found today. In the late Han Dynasty and Three Kingdoms era, another type of much simpler and cheaper shield was used by the lower rank soldiers. But again, this type of shield was also not lacquered, so we can only see it on the statues and the murals from this era. There was also several type of shield that was majorly used by the swordsmen in this era. For example, there was a type of shield called Gouxiang. Basically, you can say this is the Chinese equivalent of bucklers, but it has a large hook on the top and the bottom of the shield to block or hook enemy blades. It is very effective against pole arms, especially halberd, in a one-on-one -on -one fight, but it's not very useful in a formal battle. Because first, they are pretty useless against arrows, and when fighting multiple pikemen or halberdiers who are standing tight fighting formation head-on, there's little this type of shield can do against them, and in fact they were rarely used by the regular army in Han Dynasty. However, the irregulars, skirmishes, the mercenary of the landlords and merchants like to use this type of shield because Gouxiang are very easy to carry. Another type of interesting shield in this era majorly used by the swordsmen was called Teng Dun, vine or rattan shield, originally used by the native tribal warriors in South China. Although sounds like a type of cheap shield and they surely doesn't look pretty. The process of making Teng Dun and Haran Dun with Teng oil and lacquering is far more complex and time consuming compared to the process of making wooden shield. And if properly hardened, rattan shield can be far more durable than the wooden shield. In the novel Romance of the Three Kingdoms, the effectiveness of the Teng Dun and armors made with similar material and process was exaggerated. In the novel, they were not just super durable and can protect the user from most of the weapons at the time, they were also incredibly light. Soldiers can even use them to float on water. Well, in reality, although dry rattans are very light, if they are hardened with tung oil or lacquering, they will become significantly heavier. Depends on the technique of making the shield, they are almost as heavy if not heavier than the hard wooden shield. The strength of rattan shield comes from its excellent durability. In Ming and Qing dynasty, the rattan shield was used in large number by the regular Chinese army, because reinforced rattan shield can even stop shots from most of the hand cannons and early arquebus at the time. In Han dynasty, the rattan shield was majorly used by the auxiliaries recruited from the tribes in South China. The regular army in the south also used them, but the number wasn't very big. Another southerner shield is a type of large square shield that looks kind of like the Roman shield. It was used by the Chinese soldiers in the south for many generations. This type of shield is used by both spearmen and swordsmen in the south, and similar type of shield was also used by the native auxiliaries in the southwest. During the foundation of Han Dynasty, a southwestern native tribe called Bandunman helped Liu Bang in the civil war. They like to use large shield made from wood board in combat, and they are usually the soldier who was fighting in the front of a formation, protecting those behind them with their shield wall. After the Han Dynasty was founded, as war heroes they were treated very well by the imperial government, and most of them were no longer considered as barbarians. Many of them were also assimilated by the Chinese. But as these assimilated natives became traditional families and great houses of warriors and commanders in southwestern China, they still kept their military tradition and way of warfare. During the Three Kingdoms era, some of them chose to fight for the warlords, while some others revolted against the empire and became raiders and bandits in southwestern China. 
Okay, so let's end this video by debunking a last misconception, which in my opinion should be included in a video about pole arms instead of swords. But now that it's mentioned in a video about swords, so I'll debunk it in a video about swords. It is a misconception that claims the weapon of Guan Yu is probably Pudao. Well, <laughs> again, that's wrong. First, it's not called Pudao, it should be called Pudao, but I mean, that's a minor problem. The big problem is Pudao was invented in Song Dynasty. It was invented by the civilians in Song Dynasty to avoid the weapon restriction law in the Song Dynasty, which forbid the civilians to have pole arms. So what they did is they modified the machete, which was considered by the government as a production tool. So the machete can be mounted on a long wooden handle like a spearhead. So when the men from the government came, they can simply tell them, hey, it's just a production tool, it's a machete. And when they need a weapon for, let's say, self-defense, they can simply put it on a long wooden handle, which will give them a big advantage over those people who only have a short weapon. So this modified machete is the weapon called Pordal. As for the weapon of Guan Yu, I still think I should talk about this in the video about pole arms in Han Dynasty and Three Kingdoms era because the weapon of Guan Yu has a lot of things related to other pole arms in Han Dynasty. So, well, maybe I will talk about the pole arms in my next video. So, see you next time.